Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Whiteboard. My name is Harshan and I'm the director of business alliances at White Labs. We're a digital agency specializing in SaaS and e-commerce SEO. And I've got Pavel with me today. He's the co-founder of Juro. Now Juro is an AI-enabled contract automation platform, basically enabling legal and business teams to create, execute and manage contracts up to 10x faster than the traditional tools. A big welcome to you, Pavel. And I'm so happy to have you with me today. Hi, Harshit. It's great to be here. Super happy for the introduction. And yeah, looking forward to you, to our chat today. Now, I would love to know what innovative approach has Juno taken to redefine the contract engagement? And how do these approach contribute to making contracts more frictionless and collaborative? Yeah, I, I think kind of to, to talk about this, we might go back a little bit when we started, and that was 2000, around 2016. I think when we started, we obviously we didn't have any customers, but we had some some ideas about where the macro shift is happening. And one of the things that we really seen was that there was not a lot of like good products out there for legal teams. That's number one. And for those that were they were focused mostly on the legal part of the team. And our insight was that uh, a contract is essentially the lifeblood of the business. So that means in practical terms that a business will, like a commercial part of the business will not exist without a contract. That's a kind of a commercial business one-on-one. And that means that it's not just legal that participates in, that, in those contracts, it's everyone. It might be the sales team, it might be the CFO, operation, you name it. It's probably one of the not so many business areas that touches on everything in a business. And when we started, we wanted to have this basically a very human-centered approach to creating the software. So what that means is not just focusing on a particular role or in a particular functional use case, but really focusing on the people that are involved. And that means focusing not only on, on legal, but focusing on all of the people that interact with the contract, or all of the people that interact with the negotiations. But that was number one. So we had a very, from day zero, we had a very human-centered approach to both designing, building, figuring out what to build, interacting with customers, even hiring. So across the board, we wanted to have a very human element in sometimes the very mechanical analytical approach to building software. So design was very important. The second point was, was data. So one of the interesting things that we found for ourselves uh, and we, we thought that there's very, like quite a lot of value in was the data aspect. And that data aspect was, um, was the foundation where we said, if we can help people organize and gather their, their data, then that data represents value. And usually the classical way is that if you have a contract, you, you print it out, you sign it, you fax it, whatever, and then it lives in your drawer and you maybe once a year, you take it out, maybe like a, a bookkeeper takes it out, but that's pretty much it. So that value stays locked inside the drawer and no one has access to that value. So. We've seen value both in the data aspect of the whole commercial contract lifecycle and in the design aspect. And that's where we started. And I think that was also, sometimes it, it was like not the most optimal way to do things, but that was definitely like part of the value proposition that resonated with us, with the team and yeah, honestly with our customers. Yeah. Right. I would love to know because the platform integrates AI uh, for the contract drafting or review or those things. So can you please share some specific examples on how AI integration yeah. transforms the speed and the accuracy of the contract creation process? Yeah, yeah, of course. But obviously this, the AI, AI aspect is like very like top of mind for a lot of people. Like everyone who was not living under a rock is just basically thinking about it either building something or integrating it into their products or, or stuff like that. So we if I started with, with talking about the data aspect and that was the original kind of founding vision for Juro, where we said, basically we can build a chatbot that could analyze your contract. That was 2016. 
And like for people who don't remember, 2016 was like really the year of chatbots. <laughs> it was like absolutely the year of chatbots. I think it was like Slack was pretty hype back then. They even had their own like fund for like chat-based apps or something like this. So I, I think that was part of it. The data aspect was part of it, but we, we tried to build the a legal assistant in the form of a chatbot and, and we failed miserably. Just like after one and a half years, we said, okay, we solved some of the things that we wanted to solve, but honestly, the tech is not there. So that was the, um, like after a year and a half of working on an AI chatbot, we, we said, we just, we're going to shut it down. We're going to uh, carve out those pieces that work, integrate it into the product and wait until the, the tech is there. And I think, yeah, the last couple of years, like for everyone who is in, in the industry, it's clear that the tech is like there, maybe not fully, maybe we still have a little bit to go, but it's already there. And I think we, like the first thing that we did is we came back to that original vision of how can we enhance the experience of a user that actually interacts with a contract. And for, for us, it's like the three distinct phases because we're, we're like an end-to-end -end workflow. So the three distinct phases is the pre-signature, post-signature, and kind of negotiation flow. And essentially the pre-signature, for example, will help people by identifying how should the pre-signature flow go? Where are the things that need approval, for example? What are the drafting pieces that need to come together? And all of this is done through an interface, which is like as close as possible to a one-click solution. I think like a lot of when, especially when this kind of software scales, there's really a key aspect, the speed aspect and the risk aspect. And for the speed aspect, it's since we know quite a lot about the workflow of our customers, one note to, to say that it, it doesn't work in absolutely all of the cases. I think it works only because we know for sure what the workflow for, of our customer is. And that allows us to really have a set of assumptions encoded into the product. And another piece is basically figuring out, for example, what, what piece of the document represents a risk from a company standpoint. And do that instead of a lawyer or legal assistant or an external firm reviewing the document, we can do that automatically because AI, that's the short one. Right. Now, because you as a company prioritize user experience, what feedback have you received from users regarding the impact of the contract management workflows and how exactly brilliantly it resolves those things? That's a, I think it's a very kind of, it's a very multi-layered question. I think there is not one piece of feedback that we got. Yeah. And how we right, don't I love to understand, like, how exactly do you prioritize user experience in the platform? Yeah feedback and how that process in general looks like for you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a good way to start because I think for, for Juro, there is no specific, for example, there's like very little value in specific feature feedback. So we always start digging into, into like, how does this relate to the problems that our users are having? So that's, there, there are a lot of questions that like get asked along the way. And I think all of this is because the working with really understanding customers, working with their feedback, uh, working with their problems is really kind of in the DNA. So when we started and when we started with the, the human centered design hat on, I remember like the first thing that I did, this was before we even had a product or customers or anything is I created the Google sheet and it was like, it was funny because at first it was just a way to, to record uh, just conversations, but very fast. The whole team was using that Google Sheet to record all of the feedback that they found interesting and remarkable from any conversation with anyone that they had, whether it's an investor, whether it's, whether it's a potential customer, because we didn't have any customers back then, like a prospect, whether it's with competition, whether it's with, uh, with a new hire, anything that was remarkable was recorded there. And it was like a very long list of stuff. And it was like really unfiltered. So I think that made it very easy for people to record because this is just like per conversation, just record a line or two, what, what you remember, especially if you do that in the moment. And I think that was the, the foundation of the, essentially the feedback database that we, 
that we have developed over the years. And then it grew from one column to three columns, then to 10 columns with like different priorities. And you know how it goes. Every system uh, grows with complexity, especially if it works. And then I think that was used to every week we had a review of all of the team's comments and feedbacks. And it was a very, quite a fast thing. So we didn't spend too much time. We just went through and we talked through what are the assumptions there? What are the problems that we're seeing? And, and try to collect, what are we, what is the signal? Because th we treated this as noise and we tried to understand what is the signal that we're getting there? And is there a signal? And I think of this developed over the years, we used like a bunch of different tools. We, we went away from after two years almost of using Google Sheets, we, we switched away from it because they became just too slow. There were too many records and too many rows and columns in that Google Sheet. And I think right now, I haven't been involved in like operations for almost a year, but I think the last time I've seen the setup, it was a pretty sophisticated setup with multiple, multiple notion sheets integrated with information about customers, with information about prospects, with information about companies and people feedback, and then linking that to a more higher level problem set that we're seeing. And from a process perspective, that became a real process in the company with uh, the sales team involved in working, populating with the customer success team involved in that. And there are a couple of integrations that pull data. And then we have obviously like a dedicated design team and, and the research team. And that the, specifically the research team does like a lot of great work in figuring out what the signal is. And then doing additional deep dive interviews with our champions in order to understand, okay, is this the right signal? And do we understand it correctly? And like all of those anecdotes go into like actually in, as input for the team that builds something. So I think that became like from a Google sheet in the early days, that became like a real process with multiple systems and multiple teams working together, which is, which I think is really good because now everyone has like full transparency into what are the top problems that we as a company see in the market from our customers and how do we prioritize them? Because it's also linked to what we want to build, the roadmap, all of those stuff. Gotcha. It makes perfect sense. I mean, in fact, I'm not sure I would love to know from you, right? Are you public marketing as well with this sort of just gaining the signal understanding the market sentiment and then building the assets to market your product, like at least post development. It kind of, yes, it goes a little bit back into the marketing funnel. I, and I think a lot of our marketing is community driven. A lot of the marketing is content driven. So I think that's like, we do sense the trends and we do try to really talk about them and really understand like the pain points and the kind of almost what's the zeitgeist of like today's world what what is troubling the the legal community and one of the things i think a good example is legal ops which is today it's not such a huge thing but i think there was a time where it was like really top of mind for a lot of people and i think it, like we've seen how that overlaps with what we had as, as a solution. And I think that really helped to, to just promote and talk about not just the, the features in the product, but really the solutions that we have for people's pain points. Gotcha. Right. Now, because the platform serves multiple, um, oh, sorry, the platform serving multiple business functions, right? So it's from legal to sales, HR, finance. How does your platform basically encourages cross-functional collaboration and is yeah. streamline contract related processes across these various departments? How does that facilitation basically happens? Yeah, I think this goes back to the really the foundation from where we started. We treat contracts as a thing that lives not just in legal or not just with a lawyer, but a thing that lives like everywhere inside a company. And that means that whenever we talk about it or whenever we design something, we think about every person who actually interacts with, with the system. So that means that it's almost like a salesperson is in the same way a first order citizen as a lawyer. 
in our platform. They might have a different set of tools that they have access to. They might have a different level of uh, uh, visibility, but they, the experience that we we're trying to craft is pretty much the same level of goodness. And that means that, that they're not second order citizens, so they would not have a worse experience than, for example, the, the lawyers that craft the, the contract. So that means that for when, when a system is rolled out, for example, to, to a big kind of team, and there is a sales team in that team, that sales team, like we try to minimize, for example, the amount of clicks that sales team need to have in order to do something. And, and I think that definitely from a product standpoint, that definitely helps. That lens of looking at everything in the same kind of way, providing the same kind of experience, whether it's a counterparty, whether it's the, the user in a company or something else. But that's, I think that's honestly, that's a less for especially for enterprise deployments for enterprise cases that is like a good product baseline but it's just a baseline i think the magic happens with with the amazing sales team and with the amazing customer success team that we have that is like truly the approach shines there and i think it's just being decent human beings and that goes to the both the hiring practices as well as like how do you incentivize the team so we tend to we tend to have generally, from what I see, we tend to have like generally positive, adequate human beings. They know what they're doing. So they have a high degree of specialization so they can speak the same language as the customer does. And they like helping people out. So I think that means that when there's a tricky deployment or there's a tricky situation, the team can actually solve that. Whereas maybe by just like pure software that would be gonna that could be hard yeah okay makes sense uh any specific case study that you would like to mention or any specific success story if it's close to your heart that you will actually done wonders for that organization yeah there are so many and like with a lot of them it's basically to the we went through like with some of the companies we went through like actually growing up almost growing up with them like for years and years, they were a customer and we have solved their growing pains. I think one of the really close ones that, that I remember is, is Funnel. So it's, it's geographically, it's close to me. So I was based in, in Latvia, in Riga, and they're a Swedish company. So they're like pretty close. Uh -huh. And yeah, and I think that we had such an amazing champion there. Someone who really had the right focus of the right mindset and focus and the mindset being a, an early adopter kind of mindset, not being afraid of using and figuring out how to use tools and the focus being on really value delivered. So I think what that happens, that's some sort of magic. So when I think about that and I think about the customer, that's where I, I think we have some numbers uh, on the website because they, they are like a use case that we talk about and we've achieved some like remarkable steps so we decreased for example the number of steps that was required to get an approval so they're an enterprise customer so they, their customers are enterprises so they have quite a sophisticated contract that they need to agree and that contract requires like sign off from the operating officer kind of finance like all of that and usually it was around 15 steps sorry 50 steps to go from essentially a draft to something signed. Mm -hmm. We close the gap to three. And, and I think the more important thing is that the, the legal team that was literally hated before, before we sol solved that problem is usually that's the, that's one of the problems that I've heard like quite a lot. Anecdotally, the legal team is one of the most hated teams in a SaaS business because they are seen as someone who only thinks about like problems, uh, is very slow to respond. Well, you, you can, after some time, you can hear the same kind of complaints. And, and yeah, and I think we helped minimize, we helped to minimize that friction. And the team did a couple of really simple things like integrating into Slack and having those like one click approvals for simple stuff. And all of that, just like minimizing the number of steps that is required 
taking off the like the stupid work and the bullshit work that usually the Google team was doing, like minimizing that, like automating the small things that people just wasted time on and making sure that the, the experience for, for example, for the sales team is, uh, is seamless. They always know what's happening. They always know they have a quick feedback loop, whether things are moving or things are not moving when things are going to be unblocked. So that feedback loop actually, and that communication actually allowed for the, the sales team. I think now they, they quote them as uh, saying that interacting, like w- one of the, they love it the most or something like this. So interacting with Juro is a really great experience and they cannot live without it. I think obviously that's an extreme case, but I think it's a very good one. And an example when it all falls into place. So the use case is there, the workflow is there, the champion is there. We had great relationships and because of that, like the product really shined there. And that's my personal favorite. And I have like only warm feelings for the team that implemented that and for funnel. All right. Uh, I would love to know, uh, Pavel, from your end, like uh, how exactly is the churn rate uh, in Euro? And uh, do you have any active programs running to increase your customer retention? Yeah. Yeah. I think like over the years, the situation changed for Jura. One of the things that I think is clear, uh, whenever you do a lot of SaaS, you tend to have different, different companies and different sizes of companies behave very differently. And one of our investors, Christoph Jans from Point Map Capital, uh, he has this uh, ongoing theme of creating napkins and then drawing some nice two by two matrices there. And one of the napkins that he has is just the classification of different SaaS customers. And, and it's all animals, which helps. And you go from like a mouse to an elephant with the elephant being like 500K contracts a year to mouse being like $5 per month, something like this. So it's the distribution. And all of those kind of are, and all of those type and classes of customers behave slightly different. Uh, one of the reasons is that the really big one, the enterprise customers, they have really slow turnaround time for anything. So it's possible to have a situation where an enterprise customer buys, for example, software, and then completely it doesn't use it for two years. Yeah. And then two years later, someone in that big enterprise customer does a review and they're like, what is this stuff? No one is using it. We're going to cancel it's it. It's Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that delay skews the numbers a little bit. I think on the flip side, like if you go into the smaller ones, I think that the biggest problem for, for SaaS that deal with like small customers is the, the natural rate of chur- like the natural rate of death for those customers, for the companies. And that means that I think what was the, the average was like. 30% of small businesses are like, are closing every year from all of that are created, which is an insane metric. And it's not surprising that you actually see that spillover in numbers of users. Yeah. So I think for, for Jura, we started in the middle, which doesn't help because it's not, it's not clear cut. So I think the strategy is not like clear cut and we started slowly moving like up and up the market. And I think kind of. I don't know what the numbers are today, but they were definitely like on the 25 percentile, the 20 percentile of the top retentions for, for a cohort of customers. But then again, I think a lot of customers that we had were like smaller customers from like 2015, 2016. So that's, yeah, I think it's a tricky thing to really dig like deeper and, and segment it. No, because you gave such a good example, and I see yeah. a good you know, dog behind you. What's that story? Uh, that's uh, it's actually so. I have two kids. I have a wife, and they are trying to convince me to to get some animals, okay. uh, to get a, to get a dog and a cat. And and I'm still like I had a dog when I was small, so I know how much work it is. And it's literally like a new member of the family, uh, and I'm like it's. <laughs> Like it's too hard. And uh, this was an attempt by my wife. Uh, she, she kindly drew me this wonderful dog and to, as a gift uh, and to always remind me that like we should get a, 
we should get an animal yeah so that's this i i love it okay. it's Go amazing ahead. Uh, yeah you won't regret getting a dog for sure I, i'm a dog person and i last year i got myself a german shepherd uh, oh nice yeah, yeah yeah that's a very hard work but it's all worth it man <laughs> yeah you know, the, the affection that you get but yeah Alright, now coming back to the serious business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is also serious. I think uh, everyone should have, uh, like, animals, especially dogs and cats. They bring our level of just stress down, and that, like, probably for the really performance oriented of maybe our listeners, that's really important. Yep. Yep. Alright. Now, as an advisor to seed cap, how do you see technology technology startups like Juno contributing to the real world problems? in large global markets yeah like there there are two i think basically two two angles that i have like for this and one is like purely economical and, and the second one is is a slightly like softer one almost a social aspect i think the purely economical one is overall i think companies like true who are slight on the slightly like boring side of things not necessarily will hear someone writing a book about it uh, I have the thumb. So, and, and, and like those are boring businesses. I personally am like drawn to those, but I think those are the businesses that actually help people, like, or at least I would think that's the mission, help people agree more. Mm -hmm. And that means like creating like more economic value. If you don't need, if you can speed up the rate at which you agree, at which businesses agree, I think that means that it's easier to, to make business. It's also easier to make business across geographies, which means that there is a little bit less risk if you can ensure that the agreement that, that we have, me and you, if we can ensure that there is no risk there, or at least it's covered, then, then it opens up a way for us to trust each other more. So I think that's the economic part is, is there. And I think the social part is more on the, really on the, the last piece, the trust piece, where it just like makes makes businesses not worry too much or at least outsource the worry about the the legality outsource the worry about someone cheating or inserting a quote or, or breaking the law outsourcing that to a system that could handle that automatically and i think like a system the good part about it that is that a system is again if it has a really good memory instead of a person like the person does forget stuff a lot a system will remember and will help us agree and trust each other more because it will be more transparent. So we'll not rely on a lawyer, for example, who thrives on information asymmetry. So instead of like me trusting a lawyer and then you trusting a lawyer and those lawyers like agreeing, we can agree directly. Yeah. So less intermediaries, more commerce and more trust. I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. Nice. All right, Paul. Thank you so much. This was a really fun session. I really enjoyed my time. Oh. It was really fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time with me here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harshit. Thank you. Thank you very much.